On July 1st, 2025, history was made in the world of steel construction. At Detroit's Henry Ford Health Project, crews set the W14 by 1000, the heaviest rolled wide flange section ever made. At 1,000 pounds per foot, and with flanges over six inches thick, it marks the culmination of more than 175 years of structural steel evolution. From the first I-beams to today's super jumbos, This is the story of how we got there. Before steel, cities grew sideways. By the late 1800s, places like New York and Chicago were running out of room to expand. Architects began looking upward, but brick and mortar had limits. To build taller, buildings needed a new kind of skeleton, a frame strong enough to carry its own weight. In 1849, a French inventor named Alphonse Halbu shaped the future, quite literally. He rolled a bar of iron into the form of a capital I, creating the world's first I-beam. While the I-beam had the ability to revolutionize building construction, steel was still expensive. But this was about to change. Not until 1856 was an inexpensive method developed of converting blast furnace molten iron into steel on a quantity basis by removing the excess carbon. This was accomplished by the development of an air blast converter, of which this is one of the earliest models. This revolutionary development made possible for the first time the production of steel on an inexpensive quantity basis and paved the way for the great steel age. Combined with oversupply in the rail industry over the next several decades, this trifecta of change would prove to morph skylines forever. By the late 1800s, steel frame buildings began to rise across America replacing the heavy brick and stone walls that once defined entire cities. But there was still work to do. These early I-beams were far from perfect. Rolling mills of that time were designed to produce rails. The rollers formed only the web directly. As the web was compressed, hot soft metal was squeezed sideways from the web into open grooves to form the flanges. This process dragged the flanges through the rolls, producing uneven metal, large internal stresses, and irregular strength. Reducing web thickness and increasing flange width was also limited in this process. If more of that steel could be shifted from the web to the flanges, a section of the same weight could be much more structurally efficient. So while I-beams helped buildings climb higher, their flaws still limited how tall buildings could go. Engineers still had to rely on built-up sections. Plates, angles, and I-beams riveted together by hand. They worked, but they were heavy expensive and slow. Steel had opened the door to the skyscraper, but it wasn't yet the material of the future. All over the industrial world, realizing the great opportunity and need for improvement, engineers were searching for a better way. And one of them, a man named Henry Gray, was sketching an idea that would change skylines forever. Henry Gray reimagined how steel could be shaped. His new universal mill fed H-shaped ingots into intermediate rollers with horizontal rolls for the web and vertical rolls for the flanges, forming all four sides at once. Sets of finishing rolls then refine the thickness and geometry of the final section. Gray's design also introduced something no rolling process had offered before, control. By adjusting the spacing between the independent pairs of rolls, Operators could vary flange and web dimensions on demand, producing a broad range of beam sizes without adjusting the mill setup. The implications for engineering were profound. In one of his patents, Gray noted that a single rolled H column from his mill could match the capacity of the era's elaborate built-up sections, while eliminating the labor and cost of assembling, punching, and riveting multiple plates and angles. In 1902, Gray's idea turned into reality as the first gray mill was installed at the Differdon Steelworks in Luxembourg. For the first time, beams rolled out with true flanges, balanced stresses, and consistent geometry. And the modern steel section had arrived. Different grooves for different structural shapes. In the finishing stands, the structural shape takes on its final form and emerges 
as an I-beam. By 1907, Gray's breakthrough had crossed the Atlantic. That year, Bethlehem Steel became the first American company to adopt the universal mill process. Bethlehem built dedicated rolling facilities, developed new tooling, and published the first U.S. catalog of wide flange beams. For American structural engineers, this was a turning point. Rolled shapes with consistent geometry and quality were suddenly available at scale. It was time for Bethlehem to start promoting their new product. Their 1907 catalog highlighted the many advantages rolled shapes brought to the project. It emphasized how the new wide flange columns formed a true family of shapes. They allowed floors to stack cleanly and connections to line up without the awkward transitions common in built-up sections. Bethlehem framed this as a practical benefit. Easier detailing, simpler splices, and faster erection. They backed their marketing with hard numbers. One example showed how a rolled column eliminated hundreds of rivets and punched holes compared to an equivalent built-up section. Another laid out tables demonstrating the economic superiority of the Bethlehem beam over the old I-beam. It was engineering logic paired with quantifiable, undeniable savings. When Bethlehem released their next catalog a few years later, they were already touting their remarkable success as their new shapes had been used in hundreds of structures across the country. Bethlehem's campaign gave structural engineers the confidence to switch and helped set the stage for American buildings to grow taller. Meanwhile, back in Luxembourg, the Differdange Mill hadn't stopped trying new ideas and in 1911, they achieved another first, successfully rolling the world's first one meter deep beam, which they still make to this day. Wide flange shapes continued to evolve after Bethlehem entered the market. In the decades that followed, demand accelerated, new producers came online, and the size range pushed steadily upward. In early Bethlehem catalogs, heavy columns topped out around 291 pounds per foot. When AISC published its first manual in 1927, the upper limit had already grown to 427 pounds per foot. The next major jump arrived with the 14 by 730 in the 1977th edition. And four decades later, the W14 by 873 joined the lineup. Introduced by the very same Luxembourg mill that had adopted Henry Gray's universal process more than a century earlier. But the evolution wasn't only about bigger shapes. Steel was also getting stronger. Early rolled shapes carried modest yield strengths, typically 30 to 33 KSI, a level that held for decades until A36 arrived in the early 1960s. Later in that same decade, thermomechanical rolling and controlled chemistry introduced high strength, low alloy steels, pushing available yield strengths up to 50 KSI. By the 1990s, A992 unified the structural market with a reliable 50 KSI product and by the turn of the century, it had become the industry standard for wide flange shapes. But there was another breakthrough emerging in the 1990s at the Differdange Mill in Luxembourg. Quenching and self-tempering, or QST, further refined the microstructure of thermomechanically rolled steel, producing high strength material with exceptional toughness and weldability. These QST enhanced shapes entered ASTM standards under the A913 specification, and today, they're produced at yield strengths up to 80 KSI, a level once unimaginable for rolled wide flange sections. High strength paired with massive rolled sections has transformed what a single column can carry. Today's largest shapes have over 10 times the capacity of Bethlehem's originals, six times that of the biggest shapes available when the Empire State Building was erected, and more than double the capacity of the largest sections in the market when the Willis Tower was built. And the mill behind these milestones is the same one that has led every major advance in rolled shape capability, Differdange. The first to install Gray's Universal Mill in 1902, the first to roll a one meter deep beam in 1911, the producer that introduced the W14 by 873, and the first to apply QST to heavy wide flange sections in the 1990s. For more than a century, the evolution of the modern steel shape has passed through one door. Arcelor Middle Differdange. And that brings the story back to Detroit to recognize the next major leap by Arcelor Middle Differdange, the W14 by 1000. At the Henry Ford Health Tower, engineers selected the W14 by 1000, the heaviest rolled shape ever produced, 
for the same reason the industry embraced universal rolling in the first place. A rolled shape is more efficient than a built-up section. The W14 by 1000 isn't just the largest section ever rolled. It's a direct descendant of every advancement in this story. And I can't wait to see what's next.